Hi, Misha here, and have something kind of new. At the end of 2020, a few hobby masters finally made it in. And this is one that's really been on the docket for, oh good grief, well over a year, and it kept getting pushed back and back and back. That's not always a bad thing. That usually means that they're making the tooling better. It also had maybe something to do with the factory moving and, and whatnot. And this is new tooling here. We have the Republic F-105 Thunder, Thunder Chief, but specifically this is the F-105G, the Wild Weasel. Today we would pretty much say this was a seed suppression of enemy air defense, or defenses, aircraft. But when this flew in the 1960s, that wasn't really a term. That's more of a modern term from the 80s and 90s. Back then, this was just a way to blow the shit out of some SAM sites. Get rid of some of the SA-2s that were harassing the F-4s and the F-100s. And yeah, the wild weasels had a few mottos. Uh, the safe for work one is uh, first in, last out, because they would be first over a target area to try to flush out any air defenses, and they would fly a pattern and wouldn't leave to all the other aircraft, especially fighter bombers were safely out of the area. Another motto was, you gotta be shitting me, because they basically invited, nay wanted, enemy air defenses to shoot at them, specifically missiles. They literally just kind of floated around up there making themselves a big, big target. And this is a big aircraft. The regular F-105, the single seat, for example the D, is over 64 feet long. Well, this version, based on the F, two-seater is 67 feet long. Yet it still has a very similar performance. It can still get up to Mach 2. It's still good at dashes and even if it's not the most maneuverable in the world, it is quick, especially at low altitudes, which is what it was designed for. Moreover, it has a very good payload of over 14,000 pounds, five hard points, and carries a 20 millimeter cannon with over a thousand shells if ever needed. And of course, Hobby Master has done a 105 before, Thunder Chief. So what's the wild weasel here? Well, this really was in response to Soviet advancements in SAMs, kind of those big telephone pole missiles that U-2 and even a few SR-71 pilots talk about, and they were supersonic. They needed something to neutralize those sites, either the missiles themselves, or at least the radars used to guide them. So in 1965, a program was kind of started, and it was authorized in August. <clears throat> and the very first wild weasel types, although they weren't really called that at the time, they were called uh, ferrets, were eventually sent to Vietnam, and their first combat was right before Christmas of 1965. But these were not F-105s. They were actually f 100 F's, the two-seat version of the Super Saber. And really, all they had was some rudimentary radar detecting equipment and electronic jamming, but they didn't really have any special offensive weapons. If they found the target, they would either call it in and have other aircraft attack it, or they would try to hit it with rockets or sometimes bombs. But the F-100, it didn't have a huge payload, and it didn't have the best range endurance, and it wasn't the fastest. I mean, it was a first-generation supersonic jet fighter, so yeah. So they tried these out, but the very first program, letter designated Wild Weasel 1, lasted less than two months, and they had very heavy attrition, as in, like, out of 16 aircraft, 
15 were shot down or disabled, with many killed or captured. But luckily, many also ejected and made it back safely. So that really wasn't, uh, really wasn't the, the, the ticket there with the F-100. The F-105 was tapped in 1966. And it first started to kind of see combat mid-year. They used the F-105F, the two-seat version, originally meant to be a trainer. They reworked the rear cockpit took out the dual controls and made an electronic station for an EWO, Electronics Warfare Officer. And he was to monitor the radar and some of the detection equipment and the ECM. But at this time, they really don't have a lot of special weapons. And they have to mount several of the jamming pods and things on the outer hard points, which means they only have the two inner hard points for weapons. And so, yeah, results are uh, initially a little mixed. They were still just carrying, um, you know, bombs and whatnot. And they would often work in, in groups, you know, with other F-105Ds. Now, it was a very quick aircraft at low altitudes and very good at dashing. It had the internal bay, which could be filled with fuel, so much better range. And, of course, they could carry up to three external tanks. One thing I've done with this model, the Hobby Master supplies, is you have two exhausts here, and I decided to put this one open. This uh, served as an air brake. It also opened up to better facilitate the afterburner, so a couple of purposes. It was actually very effective, even if it's a little bizarre looking. Yeah, it's a very heavy, very chunky aircraft, and with the D and later F, they would add even more armor to protect the crew. This is why it was kind of named the Thud. Uh, some derided it, some kind of grew to love it. It was what it was. <laughs> An interesting jet, to say, uh, to say the least. So what about getting at some special offensive weapons? So this would go up there and dangle itself to try to sluss out uh, Sam sites. And if it found them, they wanted to be able to uh, shoot them down directly. One of the first weapons that was fitted for this purpose, the first anti-radiation missile, is the one here on the outer wing. This is the AGM-45 Shrike. It was an early attempt. Actually, it started off in the, in the U.S. Navy as one of their war pieces of ordnance. And it was designed to home in on that. It uh, was tested in 1967. And honestly, it didn't do great. In its first several months of operation, they fired over 100 and only had one confirmed SAM site shoot down. So only about a 1%, maybe 2 for being super generous, kill rate. Still, it was the first of a... Uh, of a new breed of missile. They started working on something else though. If you see on the inboard pile on here, this much bigger one, this is an AGM-78 STARM, Standard Anti-Radiation Missile. This not only started off as a US Navy project, this actually started off as a freaking ship-to-ship -ship missile. It's uh, 15 feet long, nearly uh, well, bumping up on a two-ton weight, it's like 1.5 uh, K pounds, and it has a warhead of over 200 pounds, whereas the Shrike here, it's under 150, so um, over a 60 pound greater yield, and it's more uh, kind of range. So bigger, heavier, and all that. And this would be first tested about 10 months, 11 months after the uh, Shrike. Now at this point, they had another problem. Again, like I said, a lot of the pods and stuff were taking, out, taking over the outboard pylons, and they wanted to free those up because the aircraft could carry quite a bit. 
So they selected 60 or 61, depending on who you ask, 105Fs, and they rebuilt them into the 105G standard here. And the most noticeable update is they took the pods and they pretty much fused them into the sides of the fuselage there. They also improved the radar and the equipment and the guidance and the cockpit to some extent. That's the kind of main visual difference. And this meant they can carry four missiles under the wings. Now not all 105Gs could carry this storm. 30 to 32 were modified with the heavy pylons in the inner there to carry them. Now it could, it could carry two, but as is oft repeated, oftentimes they would carry just one and saving the other heavy pylon for a second drop tank. They almost always had this one drop tank in the middle, plus the internal tank where the bomb bay used to be. So the payload was typically one Starm missile and two Shrike. Now the Shrike only had a range of about 20 to 30 miles. And the problem is that got the uh, weasel here within the envelope of the SA-2. It also usually got it within the perimeter of the uh, AA guns. But the Storm 78 had a range of 50 miles or greater, which meant they could usually get far enough away to be out of direct threat from at least what they were targeting. Of course, the flip side is it was so big and heavy that they could carry at most two. And its success rate wasn't perfect. Um... On its prototype run in combat, eight were fired, three hit their targets. So, and then more, and those are again earlier prototypes. And uh, in actual use, the success rate was you know twenty, maybe twenty five percent in a good day, but still much better than the Shrike. More importantly, the Wild Weasels forced the North Vietnamese to change their tactics because if they could pretty much easily avoid getting hit but they'd have to turn off their radars which meant they couldn't guide their uh, surface air missiles. Of course they could turn them back on and so this very interesting cat and mouse game started between the uh, the thud weasels here and the ground installations and just the threat of these often allowed other planes to go ahead and finish out their bombing run because they couldn't use their missiles effectively. Of course they used tactics that kind of overcame this and then the wild weasels came up with tactics that kind of overcame those tactics and later in the war the electronic systems improved and they started to get a bit of a electronic memory so even if the radar quit transmitting the missile could kind of remember where it was coming from and maybe hit it. You know, at least there was a chance. Because before, if the radar went quiet, the missile would just kind of flop around until it ran out of fuel and then just fall somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, there were 60-some-odd uh, 105Gs used. And by 1969, 1970, they were in pretty widespread use. But a problem was the uh, Thunder Chief was long out of production. The last ones, which were 105Fs, so they were the lower hour frames, came off the line in 64. And advancements and whatnot meant that they were just either being lost, as, as you, I know it's shocking, but the role of Wild Weasel meant that a lot of aircraft either got shot up or didn't make it back. Luckily, they did improve the ejection systems in these, so many crews survived. By the way, the crews were always voluntary in these. They didn't force people to do it. Thank God. <laughs> so because, you know, it was a good second generation. By the way, this was part of the Wild Weasel 3 program. But what about the two? And that's why I brought out my other wild weasel here. It wouldn't be a video if we didn't get at least one phantom in it, now would it? 
So let's talk about what was it first? The companion and eventually replacement for the Thud Weasel. The McDonnell Douglas F4G. So called advanced wild weasel. But it took a long while to get here. This would be the best and really the last seed aircraft in the U.S. Air Force. And the development to make the Phantom into an anti, I guess you'd say, um, SAM <laughs> air defense aircraft began really about the same time as they became serious about making the Thunder Chief around 1966. Some call this the Wild Weasel II. They took a few F-4Cs and tried to kit them out. They gave them a radar warning, detection. They gave them jamming pods, electronic countermeasures, even a noise kind of confusion system, all kinds of electronic stuff. And that was kind of the problem. They overloaded them. There really wasn't enough space in the airframe for all of this. It wasn't a weight thing, it was a space thing. Can't remember, we're, we're talking about 1960s electronics here. And the electronics interfered with each other. Signals from one would disrupt another. Heck, even vibrations from one would disrupt another. It didn't, um, it didn't pan out. So, they relied on the 105 for a time. But this would lead to the Wild Weasel 4 program. And it was first fielded, not in Vietnam, but in Japan in 1969. And again, they're taking 104 Cs. And these, I believe, they took about 34, 36. They updated them with more modern electronics that didn't interfere. A little smaller, more uh, compatible. They also fitted these to carry two AJ, AGM excuse me, 45 Shrikes. So it had an offensive capability. Bad news is the Phantom just couldn't carry the AGM-78. It was too big, too cumbersome. It just, it just didn't work. So it had the Shrikes, which weren't great. But, on the other hand, it was able to continue to carry its AIM-9 Sidewinders and Sparrow missiles. So it had better air-to-air -air combat abilities. And, of course, the Phantom is a smaller aircraft compared to the 105. Yeah, I, no one really thinks that the Phantom is small and nimble, but compared to the uh, 105, yeah, it kind of is. They also improved the back seat, the rear cockpit station, to make it easier, better, more efficient for the EWO to use more effectively, more automation, and it became a pretty effective aircraft. They started to move closer to Southeast Asia around 1971, and then the uh, F-4C Wild Weasel 4 was used during uh, uh, Operation Linebacker in 1972, because by this point, attrition rates on the 105s were pretty bad. And then the, the ones that survived were updated with even more modern electronics and radar and what have you in 1973 and continue to be in service but around this time wild weasel 5 was under development and that would result in this model here the f4g the prototype would first fly in 1975 and would be adopted into service in 1978 so the remaining f4c wild weasel 4s were converted back to just standard F-4Cs, which was a pretty early version of the Phantom for the Air Force. And they were given to a couple of Air National Guard units. The F-4G Wild Weasel 5 really became the definitive model here. And they would build, or really, they would they'd actually base these, not build, I should say, they would convert based on the kind of uh, ultimate version for the Air Force known as the F-4E. It had a cannon, 
internal. It had better ground attack abilities, a, a radar equipped more for targeting on the ground. Um, they could carry more stores. It was just a, a, a product improved version, you know, with the lessons learned from Vietnam. So they took several of those. Some sources say it was 116, some say 134 were converted. Now, funnily enough, they actually pulled the cannon out to make room for a more effective radar system and detection system. And they included uh, ECM, the, the, you know, the electronic suites, but by now, you can see on the tail, the pod, by now things are getting small enough that they can really fit them effectively. And they were able to replace the AGM-45 Shrike with this new missile here, the AGM-88 Harm high-speed anti-radiation missile. And this kind of was a improvement on both. Uh, high speed, uh, more effective, more advanced, and that became this aircraft's standard weapon. But of course it could still carry sidewinders, sparrows, or even bombs, because some of these could still carry cluster bombs or what have you. So this was the standard in the 1980s. In fact, all throughout the whole Wild Weasel saga, they had developed two jet teams called Hunter Killers, where one fighter jet would act and as the kind of the killer, and the Wild Weasel would act as the hunter, or they'd just kind of trade off. You saw this in uh, Vietnam with the 105D and 105G, also with various Phantoms. In the 80s, the uh, 10, excuse me, the F4G found its companion in the F16C, the multi-role fighter. And this was uh, equipping three squadrons, still active very much so during the time of the Gulf War. And uh, these flew mini missions to protect, for example, B-52 bombers and completely just go at the Iraqis' air defense systems. They did very, very well, had a very good kill ratio. Only one F4G was lost during that conflict, but luckily the crew ejected and uh, made it back to friendly airspace and well, ground space, and so they weren't captured by the Iraqis. So yeah, it did well. Now, you see on this model here, because it's from that era, it actually doesn't have sparrows in the front it has a more advanced uh, ECM pods here and they often carried all kinds of different pods over time as again electronics improved both to help its mission and keep it safe <laughs> and these continue to fly Iraq enforcing well the no-fly zone throughout the 90s but by 1995, they were showing their age. I mean, the, the Phantom itself had been out of production for over 15 years. Actually, the last ones were made in Japan, not even in the USA. They were starting to get to the end of their service lives, their airframe hours. And times were a-changing. Post-Cold War budget cuts and what have you. So, it was decided to give these... A retirement in 1996 and to be fair this was the last f4 variant in active u.s air force service if you know not counting like drones and targets and things like that so yeah they were retired out and this is really as i said the last seed aircraft the last in the wild weasel series what took over well a lot of planes that f16c as newer versions were invented, like the F-16CJ, some of these would do Wild Weasel rolls. They would do both two-seat and even some single-seat Wild Weasels, thanks to more modern computers. Sometimes the A-10, although it wasn't perfectly suited, would kind of pop a few uh, missile batteries. 
And likewise, while it wasn't really made for the role, the F-15E Strike Eagle could do really good for like long range interdiction or target strike missions. So there's kind of three aircraft that took over with the F-16 being the major one. And today, even the F-16 is starting to kind of yield the uh, seed role, such as it is, still is, to the new F-35A. And its big benefit is that it has stealth capability, something I'm sure <laughs> crews of both of these would have loved to have had <laughs> back when. And thus kind of ended... A true era. So what about these Hobby Master models? Even this one is pretty new. It came out a year, year and a half ago. Maybe two years now. It's their typical Phantom. But I think when they do a Wild Weasel, it's always popular. It's an interesting variation. It does come with the Rat Ordnance. It also comes with other optional ordnance like fuel tanks. It comes with... Uh, Comes with uh, more Sparrow missiles. As you can configure it however you, however you like, frankly. Typical hobby master, you know, wheels up or down, canopies open, crew figures in out. Good attention to detail. They may not make the the best Phantoms, but. They do make very good ones. Stands a little iffy, but as uh, you saw, if I put it out yet, maybe I haven't, in my British video, they do have an alternative stand now. But this one's the real reason I wanted to do this video. This has been so long in coming, and I really like their 105D. One thing I like this, they give you two fuel tanks for the middle hard point. One has a pass-through for the stand, which is metal. The stand, not the tank. And the other one's solid if you want to display it with the wheels down. I wish Hobby Master did that with more aircraft. I understand sometimes they can't, just because of the size of things. Um, they do give you a few options. They give you external tanks if you'd rather do the one Storm and fuel tank layout and they even give you aim nine sidewinders if you'd rather do that so you could have a very different setup from what I have here the gear again plug in as one unit again you get both tail pieces and of course you have crew in or out sorry my hands cramping it is also very heavy. It is very metal. There's very little uh, plastic on this model, which is very suiting for the thud. <laughs> very neat. Um, it was worth the wait, I think. And unfortunately, they only imported a few of these, a few hundred. They did. It wasn't a big production run. Hopefully, next year, well, this year now, they will. Uh, they will do more. And Hobby Master does do a few other Wild Weasels. They do the F4C Wild Weasel 4, if you have more of a Vietnam look. And they do do the F16CJ, although I don't know if they have it specifically in a Wild Weasel uh, payload. So, don't know. <laughs> so what do you think? Do you like these? Both? Neither? Only one? Let me know. I am well pleased. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And please feel free to comment. With that, this is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.